Hey everyone, my name is Maklit Hadero. I am an Ethiopian jazz singer, songwriter, and composer, and chief of program at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Welcome, welcome to Alchemy of the Reset. Alchemy of the Reset, the conversation series where we think about transformation because we are in a time of transformation where the systems are ripe for evolution. We are already in the middle of it. We are being shaken, reorganized. We are doing the reprogramming, writing the future right now. What's our place in that? How do we steward it? So many questions to think about together, together, always together. We are so happy that you are here with us during this hour long conversation. Uh, you will experience three questions, three questions that are like three bells that will guide us through this exploration together. We wanna invite you to use the chat feature as a robust forum for exchange with each other. Who are the other people listening? What homes? Uh, what perspectives, what land are they coming from? And, and what do you have to find together through conversation and dialogue? I also want to prepare us, just prepare us, that there may be moments of silence. And I've said this every single time we've had this conversation. So I do that to underline the fact that this is live, that this is um, an improvisation that comes from experience and the depth of experience. But when people encounter and when people meet and there's moments of silence, it's an opportunity to reflect and to really make space for the fact that we are on our edges. We are on our borderlands and we are searching for more. So we welcome it as we welcome the space for evolution to happen and we run we walk we glide arm in arm hand in hand towards it together so happy you are here with us and i will begin now by introducing our ybca senior fellow brett cook brett welcome alchemy of the reset was uh, conceived of along with uh, Brett Cook, as well as um, our other senior fellow, who I'll let Brett introduce. But to say a few words about Brett, Brett is a thought leader, an educator of all sorts. He is a maker of space for multiple voices. He is a painter. He is an artist with decades of experience, of open-armed experience in bringing people together to multiply their potential. Brett, welcome. So great to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm actually here in Oakland um, in my studio in the kind of upper office archives, printers. My real desk is over there. Kind of back behind me is the downstairs part where I have some projects going on uh, people in Oakland who died before they were 30 and, and another project about young people and young educators here in San Francisco. So to be here at the Alchemy of Reset is really kind of the most nourishing place for me right now, a place that these kind of conversations have really um, given me some life. Um, and part of that is because of the people that I'm doing it with. And now I'd like to um, introduce Liz Lerman, who's the, my also senior fellow with me. How are you, Liz? Oh, it's so good to see you both. I'm okay today, thank you. I didn't give you an elaborate introduction to your greatness, but I just feel like- You know what? Let's just get going. We've got <laughs> to do today. But I will say that I'm in, I'm in Tempe, Arizona, the, uh, one of the hot spots in the country. Uh, I'm sitting in my little office with my books and my coloring and uh, by a window where I am visited every morning by a bunch of hummingbirds, which makes me very happy. But I, um, and I just, again, just to be able to be among, uh, with McLeod and Brett during this period has just been profound. But we get to bring into our midst today somebody incredible, Carlton Turner. There are so many things that I could say about him, and everybody can go and read about him too. But Carlton lives so beautifully 
and truthfully at the intersection of, of art, land, social justice, uh, vision. And uh, it's, he, he's extraordinary. And you can see all that when you read about him. But I have two quick little things I want to say about him personally. It's a little roundabout, but there's um, there was a period in my life where I spent a lot of time in Japan. They were very interested in the work I was doing with older people. And I spent a lot of time dancing with a lot of older women. And there was something I began to experience with them, which is, you know, there's not a lot of space in Japan. So they, the way they filled space was amazing. The way they were generous with each other was amazing, but they never diminished themselves, not once. It was the way they were present with their full self. And I don't think I'd experienced that so much in America. And then I got to have time with Carlton Turner. This, this is a person who, um, whether, whether in a dialogue with one other person or holding a space for 300 people to talk, who brings this vast mind and set of images to the room, holds it for everybody, generous, and doesn't diminish himself either. And it's that, that way that he stands that, and what he brings with it that I find so wonderful to be in relationship to him. And the other thing, is uh, what happened, you guys who are listening, we, we get to get together before the show starts and we chat a little bit and it's, it's really fun, but it, it's also very interesting what comes up and I was struck again by what kind of storyteller Carlton is. The stories that you have, the things you bring to bear and the fearlessness of the content, whether it's death or life at its deepest, so I'm just thrilled to be able to be with you. So Carlton, come on in and tell us where you are and where you're talking to us from. Hi. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here and thank you all for the invitation. Um, I am coming to you today from Utica, Mississippi, uh, which is the land of my people. Um, my folks have been in Mississippi, in this area, uh, in the learned uh, Utica area for eight generations. And so I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, I remember getting the, the invitation to come and participate. And I immediately, I think I may have, uh, as soon as I got the email, I responded back, yep, I'm in. You know, you, know, you had me at um, Liz and Brett and McLeet, and I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. So Brett, you want to tell us a little bit about why is the alchemy and reset stuff? Yeah, just to, to give everyone a little context, uh, um, you know, part of the title came out of the idea that that you know the idea of alchemy, the Western idea, was this notion of of some kind of transformation of materials into something else. Um, but for us, it really resonated that when we think about this moment and this reset, that it's really um, going to take an amalgamation of kind of entities or disciplines or constituents. Um, to really make this transformation positive. And so in that way, we came up with this title to think about what is the way that we can kind of um, assemble a, a, a whole a vast array of different types of people, different kinds of um, agents who are causing transformation in the world. And so that's kind of the, the premise that has brought us to this really wide array of invitees. So, you know, Carlton, having been in story circles with you and been at uh, alternate routes and other places where we call upon personal story as a form of wisdom, a form of education, a form of learning, a form of being together. Um, I think it's out of that that this first question emerges, which is wondering, you know, when in your own life was there a new step? What, you know, what happened? What, what were the conditions? What what made that occur? Um, there's so many resets, right? It's just um, being able to pick one that, that uh, I can put into context uh, for this, this moment. Um, I would pick the, the reset of coming back to my home community uh, and um, deciding to, after 15 years of working mostly in other people's communities uh, and helping to you know, advance social justice, um, helping to advance conversations, difficult conversations, helping to build infrastructures and networks for artists um, and really focusing on the South and working to bridge artists and activists uh, and policymakers. Um, I chose to 
um, as LeBron James said, bring my talents back to Utica, Mississippi. Uh, and what's interesting about that is a lot of people uh, thought that I had moved away from Mississippi, but I've never not lived in Mississippi um, for my entire uh, life since 1977. And when my mother and father moved uh, back to, my mother moved back to Mississippi, um, my father moved here from Harlem. We were living in New York uh, and at two years old, we moved back to Mississippi and I've been here ever since. And I think the reset for me was, um, you know, being at the helm of Alternate Roots, being, you know, coming into Alternate Roots in 2001 as a member, learning about the organization, its deep and rich history uh, that has touched and impacted many lives. Liz can probably tell you more stories about Roots than I can. Um, uh, and doing that work, uh, you know, kind of like learning about artists all across the South. Um, expanding my knowledge about the, the, the connection between arts and social justice, um, being a part of a national conversation on these same issues, uh, issues of equity, issues of, of you know, philanthropy and how that shows up in our communities. It was very interesting to uh, do that work seated from Utica uh, and to have my family here, uh, my, both my immediate family, my wife and our children, and also our extended family, uh, my, my mother, her siblings, all of my first cousins, nieces, nephews, the whole nine. Um, and I remember uh, when I made the decision, I think in 2000 and uh, probably 14, when I began thinking and, and drafting the idea for what would become the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, um, I began reaching out to the mayor um, of, of Utica. And I got all my little credentials together. You know, this is where I've, what I've done, some articles I've written, here's some panels I've been on, here's some whatever, whatever. Uh, and I put it together in a folder and I um, got a friend of mine to, uh, to get a meeting with the, the mayor. And I sat down with the mayor and, uh, and I wanted him to be impressed by all the things that I had, had done uh, and know that one, that I'm serious about what I'm proposing, but also to um, to just recognize, you know, that I've, I've, I've you know, made this career in this life. Um, and him kind of skimming through those documents and uh, asking me a simple question, uh, where are you from? And I was like, wow, I'm like, um, I'm from right up the road. I was, you know, raised here in Utica. Uh, and he said, well, who are your people? I said, well, um, my mother is Genevia, Genevia Turner, and he was, that didn't ring a bell with him. I said, well, you may know her by her maiden name, which is Roberts. And he said, he looked like that. He said, uh, Genevia Roberts. He said, are you Sammy Roberts' grandson? I said, yes, sir. And he sat back in his chair then, and he put my materials away, and he said, ooh, your grandmama knows she can make some good biscuits. And it changed the entire tenor of the conversation. Um, and from that point forward, I um, had to be reminded that the currency of, of my community is relationships. Uh, it's all relational. And I had to reset the way that I was thinking about the way my work showed up and the way I showed up in space, that it, it's about the relationship. It has nothing to do with experience. It has nothing to do with marriage or, or accomplishments. It's about your ability to relate to people. And um, that has been the focus of the way that I've approached the work that I've been doing here and resetting just the way that I think about who I am and what that means uh, to the people in this community. They don't care anything about the Ford Foundation. They don't care anything about, you know, uh, grant speak or, you know, social justice conversations that I've had the luxury of sitting in um, across the country while they're at work, while they're, you know, like these things, they don't they don't necessarily uh, connect and, and make sense in, in the way that we think they make sense when we've made a career of them, when we, when we live that. Uh, and, and so that pulling out of that and getting back to understanding that the currency is relationships. It, you know, it, it, the, your story within story within stories there tells us something about what is essential, what um, in the reset, what is the opportunity that we can shed? Like what of these structures that we actually wear? You actually wrap them up and put them in a thing, you brought it to him. See all this, you know, the, the opportunity to like strip that and get down to um, something else entirely of which relationship 
and biscuits seems to be really important, but really it is. And that's how he knew her. So I, it, yeah. And it set off that moment, set off a chain of events in which um, the mayor who I didn't really have a relationship with uh, began to tell me about his relationship with my grandfather and how my grandfather hmm. got him his first job working for the county, which in that time was a very coveted job because it came with health benefits, it had a pension, um, it was it was consistent work. As long as you came to work, you were always going to have work. Um, and and through that relationship, the the mayor actually introduced to introduced me to several other men in the community that were in positions of power. That my grandfather also got them their first job with the with the with the county. And my grandfather had a sixth grade education at best, um, but he was the he was one of the richest men that I knew because his his re, his relationship bank was full all the time, even though he had much money, but his relationship bank was, was deposited up to the brim. Hmm. You know, uh, this is a little sidebar from being now in an academic setting, which came to me late in life, but when I listen to alumni, the thing that they love the most about the faculty they speak about are people who help them after they're in school after they leave, I mean, and they go out into the world. It's those relationships that, that's what you hear over and over and over again. The connections, those things that people do for each other. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, it makes me think it's been one of the threads of many of our conversations to the degree that, you know, relationships are the foundations that things are made from. Um, and I think part of the, the contracts of this moment is that we're being forced to reevaluate all of those, um, as you said, Liz, those things that we wear that are supposed to be our value beyond our relationships. You know that, and and in some ways, our leadership continues to model um, a value that's not based on relationships at all, but by some other either quantitative metric or some some random metric I can't even understand, <laughs> but certainly not a metric of like human relation, um, which, you know, I think is part of the kinship that I certainly have with Liz is like so much of our work, it comes out of that place. And I think part of the resonance of, of McLeet at YBCA is like a real kind of physical manifestation of how that's of, as an institution is trying to embody community relationships and have that be part of the staff. And I guess that's one of the one things I'd like to think more about in terms of your relationship, Carlton, is like, so with that understanding of the personal and the local being so relevant, you know, how has that, how have you been able to, or how has that learning kind of echoed into all of the cultural capital that you have, you know, that you as someone who comes from, you know, alternate roots, when I think of alternate roots, I think of it as like, you know, the repository of cultural capital in, in, in this work that we're talking about. And yet it's, I'm curious to know, like, then how do you, you know, disseminate that really significant learning to people who are still thinking about institutions nationally or somehow some national, I don't know. Yeah. Image. Yeah, Roots, Roots has always been uh, ahead of the curve. Uh, it's always been leading and in, in trying to put forth a set of values that um, were different and were, were, were transformative. Uh, and I think that that was the, the space where, you know, I didn't get my college degree until 2014. Um, I went to college uh, and quit you know, after as a senior. But um, going through alternate routes was uh, a, a master class, if you want to use that language, if you want to think about PhD, um, you know, uh, getting your PhD in something, uh, you know, that doctorate studies, it was that level of, of study and, and listening to people who have been doing work that is centered in community, that is centered and grounded in relationships with people and honoring people's humanity and honoring um, all that people bring when they make themselves available and accessible to you. And I think Roots has been a space that has helped me to cultivate what I'm willing to, to accept in terms of an organizational structure and what I'm not willing to accept. Uh, mm -hmm. And it gives me the space to challenge structures that, that, um, that I know can only yield a certain type of result. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm like, you can't expect 
the world to change, even if you're talking about your small world within your organization, if you've structured yourself in a way that is, is you know, based in, in capitalism, based in patriarchy, pa based in homophobia, based in you know, uh, you know, racial dynamics that are, that are not really upholding and uplifting the, the value of, of, of humanity and the value of individuals, the value of relationships. Um, and so roots, so I take roots everywhere I go. And I, I would say that many, many people uh, that have come through that institution, they carry those values with them, uh, not as a, a, a document, um, or a framework uh, to, to duplicate, but as a way of thinking that allows you to have a clearer lens as you're looking at, at the way that your work interfaces with the world, uh, whether that be within an organizational structure or whether that be in, in the process of you making art, or whether that be in the way that you think about engaging in, in policy issues. Um, and so what I think about is for me, um, when I came back to, to Utica, uh, and I use the word came back, I'm, what I mean by that is, is turning my work gaze from the outside community back to the community that I live in. Um, we thought about uh, this idea of community engaged design as, uh, as a starter process for how we would design the infrastructure uh, and framework for the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production. And after we, we went through about a year and a half of that, we realized that it wasn't just a structure for, um, for a process or the start of something, but that it was an iterative process that should be part of the way that we approach every aspect of our work with the community. Mm -hmm. And so what we originally thought would be um, just an exercise to help us get started became the, the principal tenant by the way that we organize ourselves in community, which is community engaged design. We don't make moves um, without engaging the community and thinking through how those things should, should show up in the public, how they should show up in larger forms outside of our community and, and so forth. Uh, and so those are really important. I think, um, you know, is this the second question? I'm not sure, because I have- no, we can't. I okay, mean, not, yeah, just, yeah, you can go. I mean, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I just want to make sure I wasn't uh, getting ahead of myself. Um, so I think uh, roots is a, is a, is something that I share by, by um, just my training. I've been trained in the, in the ideology of the way that roots manages itself. The other thing about roots that's really important is that roots doesn't have uh, roots is not looking for a destination. Like Roots is constantly iterating. It's, it's, it's reconfiguring itself based on the people that are in the room, based on the circumstances and the climate that they're existing in and trying to figure out how to maintain a, a, a code um, in whatever the environment that they've been given. And that's really different from organizations that are, are founded and stay the same for a 30, 50, 100 year term. It's why roots will never go out of style because the style will always be relevant to the people that are organizing it at the moment. Uh, and when it doesn't, and when it is finding itself uh, out of tune, it's because it hasn't adhered to the values the way that it knows it should have. It's not because it doesn't know, it's because they've, you know, they've you know, let something go. So I think roots is a really important uh, framework for me to carry with me in all of my work. Um, and so I, I brought that to Utica and I share that and I bring other Roots members and other people who've been influenced by Roots and other people who have influenced Roots uh, to my community uh, because that exposure for a rural community is really important for us to grow and develop and, and gain a sense of understanding that is greater than just the things that we see on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I, I find you know, in many of my projects, I'm using community action research or community design principles um, kind of in the same ways that you are. And if come to that same realization that it has to be iterative and, and ongoing. And it makes me think about when that as a model is not utilized. So, so for so much of our leadership nationally and even here in California where I'm at, you know, they're talking about making coalitions of people to address the pandemic, but they don't really have a dynamic collection of participants in those leadership coalitions, you know, which as someone who's had such a belief in that methodology is heartbreaking, you know, because I understand the the limitations of how directly it addresses people's needs. You know, that if I only have a select group of people there, it limits the success of of having people's voice involved in their own leadership, 
you know, in their own destiny. And it kind of makes me then think about how that relates to you being in Utica and how that goes out, you know, it, it, to the degree that it can be successful in a rural setting, um, you know, that alone is enough to make it valuable. And I'm just wondering, you know, when those opportunities that it isn't inclusive, how do you respond to those, those lack of inclusion of different voices and perspectives that could actually make the, the drive a transformation have relevant impacts? Yeah, I think that's where, you know, I think that's where artists shine, you know, because we can make those conversations that uh, otherwise would be super difficult. They would be awkward. Um, artists can can help to make those conversations relatable and, and um, make them accessible to people who didn't, one, didn't know that they needed to have the conversation um, and, and rec didn't recognize that there was something missing that they needed to connect to. Um, and, and two, those people that may have found those conversations off-putting, um, there's ways that art can be used to, to create space for people to see themselves in the issue, see themselves in the concern, see themselves in the challenge in ways that watching television doesn't always give us and you know, reading an editorial doesn't always give us uh, or getting a feedback loop from a, uh, a community a faith-based community that only surrounds themselves in church-like atmospheres. Uh, and I think the one of the challenges that we saw here um, very early on was that the lack of, we have so many communities in a rural setting that, that the infrastructure has been diminished. Meaning the community that I live in at one time, uh, it had factories, it had grocery stores, it had a thriving main street, it had two high schools, it had you know, all the different things that a community needs to thrive, it had. And those things have gone away, um, mostly because of decisions that have been made by people who don't live here in this community. Uh, and that's one thing for us to, to interrogate. One, the decision-making practice that happens uh, for communities on behalf of communities, in the name of communities, uh, and how communities can be back in a more, uh, have more agency back in that process. Um, but then the other part of that is the lack of those spaces uh, that on the surface just look like businesses or educational institutions, the school or the shirt factory or the grocery store are actually social spaces. Uh, and the social function of those spaces is that they bring people together in, um, in incidental ways. They bring the community together in incidental ways in which you find yourself having a conversation with Ms. Johnson on aisle three of the grocery store about some things and you didn't, that's, that wasn't on your schedule, that wasn't intended, you just bumped into her and it becomes this conversation in which you find out something about another corner of the community that you may not have known, you have some discourse, so you get to know their thoughts on an issue, they get to know your thoughts on the issue, and the, sur the, the social fabric of the community expanded uh, in those spaces. So they don't just hold a business framework or an institutional educational framework, they are the social fabric of our communities. When you take all of those things away, what you're left with is the community that is, is relegated to its corner. And in our case, that corner is, is the church. So it's like, you know, in, in a small community, you've got 100 churches. Everybody goes to their own church. Those are the people they communicate with. That's where they have their social functions. Those are the communities they, they engage with. And so the discourse is spread out and, and, and relegated to those corners as well. Uh, and so what, we were try what we're trying to figure out is how do we rebuild those social structures? How do, we, how do we retrofit existing spaces to hold the social fabric that it needs to in order for our community to engage in the type of discourse it needs to be involved in the decision-making that allows it to take agency back? Yeah. And that's been the way that we think about the work of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production is that we're, re we're redesigning the social fabric of the community. That was going to be, I was thinking about that as you were talking, Carlton, about the nature of agency and how people come to believe that actually their story does matter. Their voice actually means something. Oh, the thing that happened to me and my thought about that, I should bring that forward. And for so many people, that's without practice or without understanding or having a place, mm -hmm. as that dissolves, so does their capacity to say participate in design and things like that. And so 
finding these these mechanisms and ways for people to to see that. And often it's a, a it's I mean in my own experience, you know, sitting it with a circle. I'm thinking now of the officers' wives in in the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, and they told the story, and I said the story back to them, and one of them said, "Oh, I would I didn't think we were anything. You know, I didn't think I was anything. You know, and it just it was it was a brilliant story, beautiful. It's it's made the way into you know many of the things I talk about, and I, it's just uh, so the power of what you're saying to re, even recreate the grocery aisle. It's really important. But yeah, and 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 the fact that that grocery store is no longer there, there's a there's a portion of the community's self worth that that went away when the grocery store went away, mm -hmm. and so you will hear people in conversation saying. You know, if we ain't got a grocery store, we ain't really, you know, can we really still call ourselves a town, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and, and, and this is for a community that 40 years ago provided 75 to 80% of its own food. So the grocery store wasn't even that important, you know, you know, 40 years ago, but because the grocery store held that, so, hold that social space when all the other spaces were beginning to die, when the, when the schools were taken away, when the businesses closed, when the, when the factory closed, the, the grocery store was the last thing to go. And so the grocery store for them, they don't think about it the, the same way. Uh, they don't just think about it as the place where I get food. They also had a social relationship tied up in that building uh, that they didn't realize they were losing at that moment. They thought they were just losing the place that they get food, but they also lost their ability to connect. Um, and that's, that's heartbreaking. And how do you feel that, um, I, I'm just, I'm compelled to ask how COVID has um, ramped that up or multiplied that or, or what you feel the effects have been around that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think COVID has, uh, it's, it's crazy. You know, you all are in California and things are going crazy out there um, with COVID. It's going crazy here in Mississippi um, where I think last week we had one of our highest days where it was like a thousand new cases. And we only have like, we have less than 2 million people, like 2.1 million people. So you, you're talking about um, the rate of infection in our communities is, is skyrocketing. Um, we, again, going back to what I began with, uh, our relationships are the foundation of our social capital. It's like, without the ability to connect, um, without the ability to talk uh, face to face, to put your hand on someone's shoulder, um, to feel their, their visible and, and physical presence. Um, it means that people are living in a, in a type of isolation that they've never experienced here in the rural community. Uh, and, and, I, and, and the reason why I say it's different than in urban spaces is because in many spaces, and in, in, I can walk through New York City surrounded by more people than I will see in, in one day, more, than, more people than I will see in a year in Mississippi and I'm anonymous in that space. Um, I don't have connection to other people. People don't, they're not concerned with me. They're just concerned with themselves. There's a level of anonymity and isolation that exists in urban spaces that is completely different from rural spaces where everybody knows everybody and everybody is connected to everybody else in some type of way. And so for us to be experiencing this moment in which we're being asked to not connect, to stay in your homes, to not speak, to not, you know, this idea of social distancing, that the whole idea of social distancing is the wrong idea from the beginning. It's not even a medical term. Um, you, what we're talking about is physical distancing. You should be physically distant from someone, uh, but socially we should never be distancing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so people have taken this idea of social distancing um, and, and we're not sure how people are responding. What we are seeing is that people um, are going out and they're being together in public spaces, which is why we're seeing the, the increase in the infection rate. And I ask for ourselves to, to, to lend a little grace to that because these are the same people that are, we wanna chastise these people because they're, they're not obeying the rules and they're not helping to keep everybody safe. But if we think about the jobs that those people hold they're being asked to put their lives on the line for someone else, for a business every day, for, for some institution that, that doesn't look at their self-worth, only needs them as a body to move forward their business practices. And then they, but they are not being allowed to do that on behalf of their own personal self. So there's a disconnect between the way that they're 
being asked to engage in the world. They're, they're considered an essential worker. They're working in the grocery stores. They're working in, in, in warehouses. They're working you know, in assembly lines. They're working in the meat houses. You know, but when you come home, we ask that you, you know, be safe and don't be around other people. And that's just a, a, a cognitive distance that people are not willing to hold. Um, and that's, I attribute a lot of that to why people continue to, to be in social spaces with each other, uh, despite uh, the, the clear safety and health ramifications. No, I, I, I'd like to go more into that and I want to be sensitive to the time. And I really want to ask you, like, so where do you see evidence of, you know, our second question is really about, um, you know, what's something in your experience or field of experience that, that you see as a symptom of this reset or you wish could be reset? Um, yeah. And I wonder, related to whether it's these social milieus or whether it's collective uh, leadership or whatever the model is, what, what are some of the things that you're actually witnessing or wish you could witness right now? I think um, the way that I thought about this question, I emailed you earlier this morning, I was like, I just want to be clear, I understand what, what you're trying to get at with this one. The way that I understand it is uh, there's two really like a, apparent infrastructure holes that are ripe for intervention um, and innovation in this moment. Uh, and, and, I, and I see those, one is food, because our work is in food. Um, our work is about, you know, we, we feel like food is the foundational principle of culture, of, 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 of civilization, that we gather in spaces, our ability to feed ourselves. Um, it, it uplifts our ability to engage in, a, you know, when we can eat, like Fannie Lou Hamer says, when we can feed ourselves, then other people can't tell us what to do so readily. Uh, and so we think about food as part of, as a, as a foundational practice of liberation. If we have food, then, then we have some space to, to move. Um, and the other space is uh, education. Um, in our communities, like I'm sure in many communities across the country, um, our children didn't go back to school after, after spring break, right? So they've been at home since March. And the idea immediately, the response from the, the, the school district was that, okay, um, we're asking the teachers to overnight develop an infrastructure to maintain the same type of engagement for young people uh, in, these, in these spaces at home and online uh, as they would be if they were coming to school every day. Well, that's impossible. Number one, the school system as it existed when students were traveling to school every day is completely broken. So to think that you can remake that thing and make it work online and in a virtual space, you know, you couldn't get kids to pay attention and, and sit down in your class, you know, when you had them for 90 minutes. What do you think they're going to do if they can turn, if they can, all they got to do is turn the device off, right? So that's, that's a broken system that we know, already know that we're going into the fall with that system completely broken and there not being real efforts to, to, to reimagine that. Uh, and so we see that as a space that is ripe for intervention, innovation, uh, reimagination. Um, and that's where I think, backing up a little bit, I think part of the challenge that we're seeing in our country writ large is due to the systemic failure of education over, over generations, right? And so this, this opportunity to reset uh, is not just about the current moment, but could have ramifications for our our country, our nation, our communities for generations to come if we can seize this opportunity to rethink the 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 way the, the first the fundamental purpose of education, um, which up until this point has been to move people into the workforce, um, to to fill roles that we assume are going to be. Um, 20 years down the line, you start here at kindergarten. In 20 years, you're gonna you're gonna have this opportunity to fill this gap that is needed. Um, but most of those gaps are based on you working for someone else or you working towards you know uh, a, a capitalist structure that we're also seeing collapsing. So if we're reframing um, the purpose and intention of education as to create the best world possible, then what does that open up in terms of possibilities about what? young people can be learning on a daily basis that does not at all 
um, resemble the current educational 16 year curriculum of, of K through, through college. Um, that that is an opportunity that we have right now in this moment when everything is up in the air. So how do we get to that from, uh, you know, that's why we, part of why we started with your own personal story, because in some ways, how we handle our own resets are great compasses for the way that we reset in a larger societal landscape. And so, you know, when you think about redirecting your focus to where you're from, like that was a choice. Like there was some part of you in your person that was clear about this redirection. And when I hear you talk about the condition of education in our country, I haven't really seen anyone, very few people are making that same committed choice. You know, they haven't making that ability to redirect um, to these values that you're talking about. You know, and so as someone who's a leader that way, how, you know, what are the ways in which we can inspire that? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say, I, I, would, I would just add one amendment to your statement. I think that the, that there's a number of teachers who've actually been trying to do that for for generations and have been stymied by the actual system that only wants them to function in a particular type of way. Teachers don't necessarily go into teaching to not teach kids and for kids to not come out on the other end better a better quality human beings. That's usually why people go into teaching is because they have a love and desire to to instill and impart something into a, a generation so that they can be better prepared to, to engage the world. And I think if we can redirect that energy right now when teachers will have more leeway over what happens on a daily basis in their classrooms because they're not tied to uh, the, the standard curriculum, um, you know, that for many years, definitely since the Bush administration have been about teaching to an exam so this is the first year that they've already said that the testing, that mandatory standardized testing that would usually happen, you know, in the beginning of the year for certain grades and at the end of the year for other grades, that that's canceled. That's that's off for 2020, 21 school year. That means that the teachers don't have to reload and upload, um, you know, stop their curriculum so that they can teach to this test. And so there's already this this wonderful gap that exists and which teachers can actually have a year long curriculum to take students from A to B without being interrupted by this federal standards of, of, and state standards for testing. So that is a beautiful window and opportunity. And I think if, if, if challenged the right ways, teachers can move into that space and create something that's beautiful and open and engaging. So that's one, one side. I, I wanna talk about a couple of different parts of it. I think the second part is there's also an opportunity because children are at home to create other educational opportunities for them in their own home spaces that is based on them coming more full and, and whole human beings. And I think that that's uh, both the responsibility of, of, of the parent, first and foremost, always, um, but also that relationship between parent and teacher um, to create that space for some innovation to happen in that relationship. Here's the challenge. Uh, here's why that part of the challenge is, is more relevant to my community than maybe in other urban communities that um, most of the teaching that's gonna happen in the fall will rely on broadband access, just like it has whenever they're saying, hey, you know, we want you to be online on this thing or whatever, whatever, you know, for this time, and we're gonna send you your materials, you, you, you get onto this module and you work this module. The reality is that we don't have internet connection so that every student can actually uh, attend classes in that in that way. And the young people who will be most uh, disproportionately impacted will be poor black kids that are living in the most remote parts of the rural community, right? So if we know that you're not gonna have access, we can do a couple of things. We can put our attention in trying to build out the broadband infrastructure and create device accessibility so that these young people can participate, highly unlikely, you know, just to be real, you know, they haven't been able to do that in, in, in you know, in the time that we've had. Um, but the other uh, space is that there's a there's an opportunity to create an infrastructure and to fill that gap that's going to be left um, to build curriculum that takes young people out of out of that space of waiting for a device or waiting for your Internet connection and saying there's a world around you that you could be learning from that will actually enrich your ability to live in this place. 
um, and we can help you do that. And I think that's about us building and further strengthening our coalition with teachers, um, with retired teachers, with educators, uh, with administrators that have a vision and have wanted to participate at a high level, but haven't been an opportunity. Yeah, it, it's been it's interesting, even as you speak, Carlton, thinking about what's what I've noticed here. Like, it just seems to me such a remarkable opportunity for our, the university. It's going to have half the students. You know, I mean, so many things are why not go for like a, a, a million experiments and, and it's going to and see see what is possible. Uh, and I would just say that here in Phoenix, well, what you just said is true for in my anecdotal evidence of my own students, students of color, first generation students, when we went remote, the not good internet, uh, less skills, they might have only gotten a computer when they got to college, uh, in homes where they couldn't have so uh, space by themselves to suddenly be online, they, they were in rooms with many, many people. So the, 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 the notion that this is the only way to go. But the other thing too is, and this, you know, I mean, this has felt lifelong to me and probably um, all of us on, on this, this round, is, you know, in some ways I feel like my art making is, is an ongoing educational experience. Like I am constantly in learning mode while I'm making whatever I'm making. I mean, it's one of the great joys actually. And I, and I think to how, um, you know, how artists not necessarily teaching chemistry through dance, although I can do that, but more, <laughs> more what's the, What's the thing that you want to know about? Go outside, you know, what's the thing? Oh, that bird, oh, this or that. And then go make stuff around it. And, you know, which is actually what Charles Darwin did with his children. It's wonderful to read about how he educated his kids. They were outside the whole time. He just followed their noses. So, so much opportunity. Whether we can do it. Yeah, no, it makes me think of, uh, I don't know if you know this, Carlton, but one of my degrees is in education. So I taught elementary, junior high, high school, college, lots of different things. And um, then when my first child, I made it a point that um, up through sixth grade, I spent every Friday in a school. So the entire day, you know, and initially I thought there's so few teachers of color, so few men teachers, this will be a gift that I can give these communities. But then it ended up being such a great thing for me as a parent, like to be that intimate to the institutions and know all the players, know all the kids, you know, like those are my nieces and nephews now, you know, now they're in high school, but Relationships. Up is I could really see what'd you say? Relationships. Exactly. Exactly. And in that same way, I could really see them. The masterful teachers would be the ones that would find a way to create their curriculum outside of common core or outside of, you know, somehow they would still fulfill those requirements, but their curriculum were these flea flooring things that address the things that they were interested in and they integrated student driven learning and all these things. And part of their mastery wasn't just that they did that in the front of the classroom. They could navigate the institution to do that. We're like a new teacher. They're still so consumed with Common Core, what they're supposed to do on the lesson plan and the pacing guide, like they aren't able to weave that in, you know? And that was such a great uh, lesson um, for me that I think what you're talking about is also still a challenge for teachers and, and those administrators, you know, is that they're still real thinking of restarting schools through a framework that's based on a tradition that they're using as a protocol, you know, and what I hear you saying, Liz, is what I find myself saying all the time that we as artists, we create the protocol all the time. We just make a new one all the time. We're, we're committed to learning. And so we'll just make it up as we go. And we don't want to repeat it. Like if we did it one time, we did it already. We know it needs to be iterative, you know, and that's the kind of absence that I think is missing in a creative um, kind of leadership positions, not just in schools, but all over. Yes. Yeah. I keep being struck by the, you know, um, Carlton, something you said at the very beginning of this conversation is just like sitting over here, like, or maybe more like here, like right above my right shoulder, <laughs> which is the, the, first of all, the story of, of, of your grandmother and knowing your grandfather, you know, and the mayor, but also this, there's a sense in everything you're saying for me that is about relearning what we've forgotten. 
I keep I keep coming back to that that our that we have an ability now to re like. Like, you know, when you're really busy and you're really consumed and your head is down and you're just trying to get it done. And then now we're in this place where suddenly we're like, we can look up and we can say, what are we forgetting that we already knew? And then further from that, how do we put it into place and make those inherited wisdoms equal to um, and systematized, systematize them so that we can all benefit, so that we can all benefit. And I, I, I just, there's something about what you're saying that keeps bringing that up for me. What can we implement that we already knew that we have forgotten? Yes, um, I did a talk, I don't know, it, I don't know how many years ago it was, but um, it's the phrase that I use that sums up exactly what you're getting, which is, for me, coming from the community that I come from, um, innovation is an act of remembrance. It's an act of remembrance, it's, an act of, it's not about creating something new that didn't exist. It's about remembering that you actually already uh, overcame this, you already crossed, your, your, your forefathers all actually, they, they already solved this issue. Uh, so much of the indigenous knowledge that we have um, that has been buried uh, in our country has already solved climate change. Sorry, solve you know uh, the issues around around energy and and issues around you know how to sustain um, groups of people on 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 the land that you that you stand on. Like those issues ain't really issues. The issue is capitalism has 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 erased that knowledge because it it, it only can thrive when it has you trying to figure out um, things that you've already figured out, like like constantly giving you the same puzzle over and over again. But we actually solved that puzzle. Um, we just need to keep the solution in the minds of, of the generations as we move through. And so I think this, this, this is a possibility to do and resurface this information. Uh, the way that we're approaching it here at SIP Culture is that our work is about food and story um, and the ability for us to tell those stories the ability for us to engage our community in, in both uh, exhuming the collective um, memory that, it, that, that our com community has um, and bringing it back to, um, to, to the forefront of our public discourse allows us to both, both, you know, at one point we were talking about who is growing what, where is food, you can get this. Oh, Mr. Such and Such grows the best this. You can get that over there. Oh, you looking for that? Miss Such and Such, she got the best greens, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you want this? The person over there, they're the carpenter. They, you know, like all of the things, um, the community was a production factory. It produced all the things that it needed. Now what we're talking about is how can we get a big box grocery store to locate itself in our community? So that's a completely disconnected framework for for how how we engage with our with our land with our with the place that we live in, and so what we're trying to do is not this isn't about nostalgia, it's about learning. It's about it's about collective memory. It's about uh, remembering that there that we've solved this issue and we know this problem and we can figure this out again um, if we work together and, and we can you know use these stories as a place to jump off to, to, to develop those 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 new solutions um, you know we had and, and it's just relates to, to education you know the earliest schools in my community the schools that my mother attended, were community schools. They were they were part of the public school system, but the teacher was from down the street. She went to church with you. She knew your mama, she knew your grandmama, she knew your big mama, she knew everybody. She was a part of the fabric of your life, not just a person you see for an hour and a half here on, on B Day in school. This person was was part of your extended community. And that's a different way of learning, not just teaching, but of learning. When you're in a room with someone you respect that knows how to garner your attention, how to engage you in a relational conversation about how this thing that we're trying to learn is actually related to the life that you're living. It's not an abstract idea that is based here in left field. It's actually part of the thing that you, you need to survive. Um, and I think that that shifts our ability to, to function and 
to remake our communities in um, in in the shape and format that that we need uh, to survive and thrive. You know, Carlton, hearing this, it, um, I, I, the analogy is a poor one, but it, it makes me think that back to the how people feel about not having a grocery store in your town, and that they they don't feel as they might feel better if they had a box store or. Uh, the issues here again at the university, it's like the reward, the reward system is so screwed up and the mechanisms by which people think things are good have to be entirely, well, either you step outside of the system and you develop your own and you are assured by each other and by the nature of what's happening that you know this is the thing that you want. Um, so it's, yeah, you're totally outside and or we just keep trying to change the way people um, we measure what they, what we value mm -hmm. and i i feel it here too at the school i keep saying we're going to need skunk groups we need to step outside the system if we really want to change this thing we have to you know we can't uh, because it's just driving itself even in the reset it's driving itself yeah so the third question i feel like we've we've touched on it a lot <laughs> already but just to make sure we ask it, the, the the third kind of guiding question was now, you know, in the wake of current social crisis, what is possible in the reset? Is there anything you'd like to add? I have a, I have a very short answer um, that I'm sure I'll make longer than it's necessary. But the, the answer to that question <laughs> is anything is possible. Um, and and and, and that's, that's on both ends of the spectrum. Um, you know, the, it's possible that we can utilize this moment as a um, as a multi generational point of, of transformation. That that you know, you know, we so many things are at play right now that allow us to rethink healthcare, to rethink education, to rethink the finance and the banking industry, to rethink transportation, to rethink you know um, communications infrastructure, to rethink all of these different things. Um, and in the absence of those things functioning properly, we also have um, this, this opportunity for power brokers to, to completely de demolish the scales um, to where there's no balance and there's, there's, there's very little um, possibility for balance to be regained in the future. Um, so we're a very, you know, it's this, it's, it's the, it could go either way. And I think movements that we've seen in the streets are pushing um, the the world, not just our communities, but it's pushing the world to to make some 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 fundamental recognitions. Um, it's polarizing, but it's also you know making uh, making some statements, uh, and it's creating a, a, a sense of of like you know we've had we've tried to do it the Colin Kaepernick way, uh, that is peaceful, you know, silent, that is um, solemn. Um, and powerful, uh, and that's not acceptable. Um, so now we can we can ramp it up because we have you know nobody's working. Uh, you know you know we're every all the social conditions are right for that to 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 do its own thing as well. So yeah, anything is possible. Um, I was telling my son, you know, he was asking me early on in this in this, in this pandemic, you know, is this the end of the world? I was like, yes. And no, yeah, it's the end of a world. Uh, it's coming to, we're seeing, uh, we won't see the return of the world the way that it, it was before. But what comes on the other side, we have to be, we have to be complicit uh, in, in what, what happens there. We can't allow that to be shaped without our input, you know, so we got work to do. I think that's a, a wonderful recap, not only, Carlton, of our time with you in this last hour, but also of the last four sessions that we've had. Anything is possible, but it's up to us to participate, to be part of defining what that is, and that relationships, that our pouring our energy into relationships and our collective wisdom is going to be an a deeply important part, an essential part, perhaps the essential part of how that unfolds. This has been a thread for us throughout the past four conversations that we've had. We really wanna thank you so much
for for sharing your time with us and the powerful work that you do. Um, we are so appreciative of, of, of everything um, that you are doing, not just in Mississippi, but also that, that you, are, you are modeling a new way that is an ancient way that, that, we, that we need so badly right now. Thank you, Carlton, for your time. Thank, Thank you, you. Liz and Liz, as always. Thank you. And thank you to our audience, um, the people who have joined with us for this past hour, for these past four conversations of Alchemy of the Reset. This is just our first iteration, so please look out for more from us around this topic. And we will see you next time. Be well, be well, be well. <laughs>